Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming. And today we talk about a universal subject. That is the values and relationship between East and West, the Orient and the Occident, and how we can learn from each other. When I started out on the Buddha's path, uh, my mind was really, really questioning everything. Lots of doubts, lots of uncertainties, and no direction. At that time, when I met Buddhism by virtue of Zen Master Sung San and uh, his students and his supporters, I felt I found something really meaningful, really wonderful, something to be followed. And that did not stop to the present day. But what changed is the view. And it's very wonderful if your view changes over 25 years. I mean, that's what we are here for. That's why we are born, so that we would find our direction and change ourselves for the better. When I came to Korea first, that was over 20 years ago, and I found a Korea which is radically different from today. At first, we had to get used to the group-based society, the values which were preliminary outlined by Buddha Shakyamuni, Confucius, and Lao Tzu themselves. So as you say, Bulgyo, Yukyo, and Dokyo, Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism, they all are unified in present-day Korean culture. And although on the surface you may not notice it, that much anymore is still there. The West, however, has been characterized by and still dominated by three major monotheistic religions, starting with three important figures, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. If you look at these three individuals, they were teaching something uniquely in common. That there is one God, and one God created everything and everyone, and you must obey that God. However, counting all the versions and uh, variations over time, we have many ideas who or what that God is, and how it is correct to follow that God. In the Orient, likewise, we have many variations and sub-traditions of Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Confucianism, which, by the way, are not isms in the Orient, in the East. They are all called the path, Do. And that path is very important. And that's what seemed to be very important when I found this teaching 25 years ago. The West thinks in terms of linear time. We still do. No matter how much our product cycle or nature cycles affect us, in terms of existence, human beings, the universe, most of us believe that there was a Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago, and that's how we originated. And then it goes until the Big Crunch or the Big Rip. There are various scenarios how this universe will end. But still, in the West, we are dominated by linear time and the three-dimensional space. The Orient is very interesting because since those three individuals that I mentioned were teaching something very different, in the Orient, we think in terms of cyclical time, many cycles of not just the seasons, but also births, and that's including individuals, families, societies, and maybe even the universe. Because of this difference, we treat each other also differently. You teach something very different in the West when you say, okay, linear time, once it happens, it's gone. In the Orient you teach well, it's cyclical time, so if you did this once, you can do this again. If you have the same habits and the same mind, you can do this again. 
So the notion of cause and effect is radically different in the West and in the East. How can you really demonstrate this? The 20th century is like a glass horse. All the sicknesses of humanity came out in the 20th century stronger than ever before. So when Western thought was imported to the Orient, then China changed. Japan changed. Korea changed. And how these societies started to treat individuals, groups, and the environment are reflected in the kind of thinking that they imported. At the beginning of the 20th century, communism took root in China. Taiwan escaped. Japan made Korea colony. And less than half a century later, Korea was partitioned, and Japan had to start a new society after the Second World War. These are just small instances of social, political, and mental changes in the Orient. But what happened in the West was also very interesting. By the two world wars, we got so disillusioned that many, many people started to look for the Orient, look for some new solutions, look for some new ways. And although this inquiry existed before, even centuries before, large amounts of people only got started in the 20th century, especially after the Second World War. So Oriental thought, Oriental philosophy, Oriental approach to human mind, life, and death entered the West and took root in the West. And it would be unthinkable to imagine Western society without yoga or Zen or Tantra, just to mention some of the words that became part and parcel of developed Western society. What can we get out of this chaos? These changes in the 20th century were traumatic, chaotic, disorderly, and many societies or families have not gotten healed after that to the present day. I think we should look at the very foundations and look at these three individuals in the West and the three individuals in the Orient, what they taught, how they influenced their society, how they influenced the view on individual, group, and the world. Fundamentally, the notion of an external God creating everything made human beings the created. And therefore, most of the primal responsibilities of ours were projected back to heaven. And it is very hard to reacquire these responsibilities. Nature is our greatest teacher to do that. Another human being can be our greatest teacher to do that. And the West developed an individualistic, critical, creative society where, besides the many achievements, we have to treat many sicknesses as well. One is the isolation and alienation, which started about 100 years ago. Not just Western philosophers wrote and talked about it. Society felt it. The transition from the Romantic and Classical age was nothing but traumatic. And it really started with the First World War. The transition in the Orient started with the overthrow of the last Confucianist dynasty in China, and almost the same time, the beginning of the colonial era in Korea, and the imperial rise of Japan. The Orient had to learn something as well, that following Western values, 
and listening to money and power and expansion alone is very dangerous. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were one of the examples where humanity reached a border to which nobody ever wanted to go ever after. Nuclear war as a vision is so terrible that we humans never ever dared to do this after 1945 and high hope that this would never happen again. Collective responsibility in the Orient, individual responsibility in the West are best if they are harmonized. If the individual is overemphasized, we cannot associate and form groups because we cannot really connect. When a society says, trust no one, every man for himself, then it's very difficult to think in terms of an integrated group or a harmonious hierarchy where everyone has a place, a job, some meaning. However, if you look at the Orient, traditionally, everything was hierarchical. Everything started with the eldest and went to the youngest, the furthest and came to the closest. And this hierarchy hides the individual. If a nail doesn't stick out, it doesn't get hammered. You all know that proverb. However, if that nail doesn't take responsibility, then it cannot hold two pieces of wood or metal together. Both are necessary. Belonging to a hierarchy and taking individual responsibility and creativity for that matter. I no longer believe there could be an ideal society on earth, just like I do not believe that individual perfection is a reasonable possibility for anyone on earth within a single lifetime. Our lives, whether individual or collective, are characterized by three very important traits. One is impermanence. No matter what we do, we are impermanent. Whether we look at it collectively, how societies and civilizations change, or individually, how we as a person change our face, our voice, our bodies, our thoughts, our emotions, our speech, it all changes over time. That is impermanence which we cannot escape. And it doesn't really matter what we think happened before our birth or after our birth because the only thing that we can get in this impermanent time is this moment. The only thing we can truly attain is this here and now experience whether we think that time is cyclical or linear. Whether we believe the group or the individual is more important. That's why in Son Bulgyo, in Korean Zen, and other forms of Zen practice, we do not treat these worldviews or social views as important. What is important is your mind. What is important is the quality of your mind. How much ignorance do we have? How much enlightened wisdom, selfless compassion, and altruistic help do we have? These qualities define us. Our decisions that influence these qualities make them bigger or smaller, increase or decrease them. These decisions make up our personalities. So we can and we should talk about the middle way where we harmonize these values. But before that, we should also mention the other two important characteristics of human existence on this earth which is imperfection and interdependence. So these are the three I's, impermanence, imperfection, and interdependence. Imperfection is the simplest to see. One day you buy it, next day you throw it away. And you want to buy another one, because your idea of perfection changed. With human relationships, it's even worse. Sometimes you dump somebody and then you get dumped the next day because somebody proved more perfect. 
better in some way or another. And then you had the same karma and you were treated in the same way. Consumer society really conditions us to treat almost everything and sometimes even a person as a product, as a consumer item, as something or someone we could acquire, enjoy, and then discard. And of course, most of us do not operate that way. But this mind is present in some places. Most of us value trust, loyalty, love, very much so we sacrifice ourselves to a certain extent, we change ourselves to a certain extent, we accept the other, tolerate the other to a certain extent, to have these values. But many times we can see that in some minds this is not the case. Then whether this happens in the Orient or the Occident, in the East or the West, there is loss. And that loss is something that we all feel, but it is extremely hard to define. So when we spin up the wheel of impermanence, imperfection, and interdependence, what is it that we lose? We lose ourselves. And to the extent that we understand ourselves, we feel the pain. To the extent that we see our path in the world, we see the diversion. We see that we made wrong decisions. And the resulting suffering then is our karma. The Buddha talked about this very clearly in the Four Noble Truths. And in the West, people are interested in Buddhism primarily because the Four Noble Truths are so practical and in their essence, they are not religious. You don't have to believe some idea or dogma or some orthodox view. You just have to see the fact of suffering, the cause of suffering, the end of suffering, and the way to end suffering, quite like a doctor. When you diagnose the illness, you see the cause of the illness, you have the medicine, and then you have the cure to apply to administer that medicine. This was one of the reasons why in the scientific and sometimes atheistic West, Buddhism and its variations took root and became very, very popular because people felt the potential there. The potential to go beyond simple consumerism, materialism, atheism on the one hand, and on the other hand, we could also go beyond rash religious extremism. This religious extremism is currently killing people in the Middle East. It used to kill people in Europe hundreds of years ago. And it took us two world wars to put a stop to that. When we realized that this is not the way we want to take. So you might ask, why is our learning experience so traumatic? And one of the main reasons is that we as a species, we forget our experience. If we didn't, then only one war on Earth in the prehistoric times would have been enough to preserve peace. But alas, if you look at humanity, we forget our own experience as a species. And we repeat these over and over again. So this is why we need to go beyond impermanence and find something that can withstand the tests of time and the tests of experience. And then we can choose our path wisely and correctly. I think this is enough for an introductory. And I would be very happy to hear your questions. Even in Korean, if you like Hanguk Maloto Chilmun Hashututeo. Sim, you said imperfection is the is the character in Western Western world, right? Everywhere, not just in the West. Mm. So But consumerism spinned it up very much. It wasn't so speedy in the Orient. These societies were very slow before the twentieth century, and that was okay. Imperfection took a material form, we call it obsolescence. So you buy something 
And then the next day, you see another advertisement. And next month, you see a new product. And in two months, you throw it away, and you buy another one because it became obsolete. In other words, imperfect. But when you bought it, it was the best on the market. Uh, so before uh, capitalism started or de and developed, see, I think uh, imperfectionism uh, that didn't exist in Oriental society. We, once we get, uh, obtain something, we try to keep it as long as we can. It existed, but not to this extent. Look at those who could afford to have a new palace or more horses or more women or men. Those people who could afford to make their environment obsolete and renew it, they did it. But for most people, this was not an option. They couldn't afford it. They couldn't even think about it. So they were conditioned, as you say, to keep their relationships, their belongings, their living spaces, their locations to the maximum possible extent. So it was there, but much smaller and much slower. I see. Okay. So in, in perfection, that uh, idea was uh, uh, not, um, not usual to Korean society. So the other ideas you mentioned, like interdependence or what else, that you see, I frequently, impermanence. Yeah, yeah, impermanence, impermanence. Frequently, I heard those concepts, but yeah, okay. So perhaps it's good to link our current situation with our potential. So I've drawn a very broad outline of historical and cultural points, and I would like us to see the potential in our practice, in our son practice. Because there are many ways to attain a clear mind, to attain a non-dualistic consciousness, to attain some good human values like wisdom, compassion, and help. But the directness and the no-nonsense approach of Zen or Son is something really, I should say, foolproof. Of course, we can make a mess of everything. That's a human potential. But in Son, when you ask, what is this? What is this mind? And what is this? What is this world? What do we have in common, human beings? How do we create our lives and deaths and circumstances? This directness helps a lot. We cannot hide. We cannot hide behind wonderful symbols and books and cultural facts and historical items. We cannot use other people's thoughts just to avoid responsibility. So ever since the sixth patriarch, we have this question very clearly pronounced. He said, key point in his life, when you don't think of good and bad, what is your original face? It became a much shorter question. What is this? And you turn that energy inwards, and you let everything fall away. All your thoughts, all your feelings, all your wanting mind, checking mind, holding mind, attached mind, any kind of illusion, any kind of identification, you let it fall away until only the question remains. And then there's a point when the words of the question also disappear. But the question itself remains there. And that's when your mind becomes one. That's when inside and outside become one. That's when the wall of yourself disappears. And ultimately, this is the experience in many forms and many ways which people are looking for when they want pleasure, power, or purpose in their lives. So these three concepts actually formed important psychological schools in the West. Freud was dealing with the notion of pleasure, what it means for humans to be pleased physically, mentally, emotionally, whatever. And that pleasure, he believed, was the driving force in people's lives. 
Then another person appears in Vienna, Adler, who says power is the main driving force in people's lives. They want to get to the top of their hierarchy. And of course, there were many other people who talked about various ideas of the human self, like Jung and Maslow and other people. But the third big paradigm was purpose by Frankl, who survived the concentration camp and established something called logotherapy. And logos is meaning. So what is more, most important in our lives? Pleasure, power, or purpose? And if you look deeply enough, you find out that we need all three, but in different proportions. Each one of us has different ideas and different needs concerning these three. And one is something, and there's something very clear. If you overdrive one, then the other two decrease. So if you have too much pleasure in your life, you lose power and you lose purpose. The best example is an addict. Too much pleasure. As Lao Tse said, too many desires wither the heart. You look at the other extreme, power. Very powerful people, really, really powerful people who can keep their power, not just get up there fast and lose it fast, they do not deal with so much pleasure. They can keep that down. They are like almost ascetics. Not ascetics, but almost like that. Otherwise, they couldn't keep their power. Also, the purpose of that power is sometimes not so important. If they deal with the purpose too much, then maybe even power and pleasure will not be so important. So what seems to be a good influence on people is that you outline these three things, impermanence, imperfection, and interdependence. And first we see that. And then you have the other three, pleasure, power, and purpose. Now, these can be very good antidotes to our own illusions. Because if you want to understand how these three work, you have to understand yourself. And most people in this life want something. And I put money and power into the same box. Because political power, financial power, social influence, they all do one thing. You can make the world follow you. You can make other people follow you. And that is power. How much of that do you really want? For some people, it's enough if one little doggy follows them. For some others, the whole world must follow them, and then they are satisfied. Why is it important to put the three I's and the three P's together? Because no matter how much power, pleasure, and purpose you may have in your life, you cannot escape impermanence, interdependence, and imperfection. There's no way. But you put the twice, three together, just like to put the three individuals in the West and the three individuals in the Orient together, and then you can attain the middle way. You can attain harmony. You can attain balance. But the practical application of that must come out of your own experience. And without some kind of meditation practice or inner work, as they say in the West, attaining this experience is impossible. It would only remain an external idea. Ideas are the most creative and the most destructive factors in our lives. What do we do with them? Well, just like with anything right in front of you that you are interested in, you can and you should test it. If you put an idea to a practical application, you see its worth. You see cause and effect. And once you see cause and effect, you can rely on that experience. And that's how we learn. Any more questions? I, I get uh, out of control sometime. So I want to ask, uh, can, how can I control my body and my soul? Uh, 
What makes you lose control? Do you know that? Uh, there are three things uh, uh, require um, anger, um, woman. These three yeah. things. Yeah. The notion of these three things, where do they come from? I don't know. That's important. If you don't know where they come from, you look deeper inside. Even deeper and even deeper. What you have now is a small don't know. It's the lack of information or the lack of experience. Don't worry, we all have that. But if you practice and you go through your own karma step by step, you attain big don't know. Like astrophysicists, they attained big don't know when they wanted to have an idea what happened before the Big Bang. And nobody knows. It's a huge don't know. What happens before women and money and power and all these things appear in your mind? What kind of mind is that? We all have our explosions inside, explosions of desire, anger, or ignorance, or creativity, Friendship, love, all kinds of explosions in the mind. Your system does that everywhere. What is the mind which is before all this? And that's why we ask the question. So to go from small don't know to big don't know, from small self, the ego, to your true self, true nature, there is a path. And that path is characterized by questions rather than definitions or dogmas. That's why in Zen we say, do not depend on the scriptures. Directly approach to human mind. Attaining your true self means you become Buddha. And the transmission of this is from mind to mind, directly. So when you ask the right question and you keep that question, it's like a compass for your consciousness. It keeps it steady, 180 degrees, boom, you go. So every day, if you practice the Huadu in Korean, the word head, do is the head. Hua is not just word, it's any kind of appearance, any phenomenon. And when you keep that question, you attain the mind which is before these explosions these kind of appearances. In another way, you can call it a mind which is clear like space, clear like a mirror. And then you can reflect everything. This kind of reflective, mirror-like mind does not have any inherent qualities. Inherently, it doesn't have anger, desire, or ignorance. So when you see things clearly, and you see people clearly, and you have a choice, and that choice is sometimes the matter between a very good life and a very bad life. Sometimes helping somebody or ruining somebody. And how does this choice appear? If your mirror is clear, you see the options. If your mind mirror is not clear, then your habits control you. And before you know it, you have chosen a, another path because some habits control your mind. If you practice, you can attain this clarity. The potential is in each and every one of us. It's called Buddha nature, or in Korean, Bulsong. And this Buddha nature is our potential for enlightenment. Originally, all of us have this. But very few of us have realized it to its fullest potential. And those who did are called the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and great patriarchs. So you asked a very good question. But it's up to you to endure the answer. We can ask very good questions, but how much can we endure the imperatives that come up with the answers that we get? Now, that patient endurance is also another very important human capability. 
And along with that comes loyalty, humility, and service. And then you see that you don't live your life for yourself. You live it also for other beings. And when you balance that, then equanimity, harmony, and shared happiness, they all come. It is possible to live like that. I want to know about your purpose of your suheng. Well, at first, my purpose of suheng or meditation practice was to solve my own problems, my own doubts, my own indecision. Then I realized that it doesn't stop here, neither from inside or from outside. So if I want to solve my problem, I have to help others solve their problems too. We are not isolated. So there's a bumper sticker in America, your ignorance is not my bliss. And it's a very funny way of saying it, that we are very much connected. Your problem immediately becomes my problem. And my problem, or my solution, immediately becomes yours too. So, if you want to help yourself, help this world. And if you help this world, then you have already helped yourself. It's a very important point. It doesn't mean that you can evade or escape your inner work. But we have a huge connection with each other. We are totally interrelated. This interdependence is not a theory, it's a fact. So, what is most important? Moment to moment you see that, and you apply that hierarchy or priority, and you help somebody, it's like helping yourself. And you solve something inside yourself, immediately your relationships change, because your mind changed. So over time, I realized that this is a wonderful job because I will never be unemployed. This world reproduces suffering way quicker than we could have enlightened minds to alleviate that. It's very disproportionate. We have seven billion human beings and counting, and most of them don't practice. Most of them don't turn their energy inside. Most of them do not do the inside homework. They only go with the critical changes at the speed of sensory perceptions. I call it body speed, because as it hits your body, or as it comes through your body, you believe it. But how about mind speed? When you turn your energy inside and you ask the question and you clear your, your mind mirror, then you see inside your mind way faster than the external experience could come. As a practitioner, you will always be needed. This world will always need clarity. So whatever your external position is, whether it's cleaning the floor in a sonpang, or being a teacher, or being an abbot, or being anyone in Buddhist society or in the practitioner society, it doesn't matter. Your internal job as a human being is already clear. You clear this mind, you clear the world. You help this world, you help yourself. So I found that the concept of suffering, of course, changed. At first, it was very individualistic. And it's very, very necessary. Even the Buddha had that. And most practitioners had individual suffering before they went into the path. Otherwise, it would have been just like a shopping trip. Go, buy, enjoy, leave. Those people who stayed on the path, they had suffering before and sometimes even during that. But the notion of suffering changes. It stops being your own problem. Once you clear this up to a certain extent, then you can help others. Then you see the family problem, you see the social problem, you see the global problem, and you try to help that in your own way. Very important. Nobody has to be a big activist, you know, to do that. But we have to be very clear 
and have some wisdom and compassion and selflessness to do that. So what keeps me on the path? Everything and everyone. Loyalty is first. Because you got saved by somebody's mind, that was my teacher. Then I have a duty. It's my obligation. But it's willingly undertaken obligation. You cannot go against your own nature. You cannot even go against your own karma. So how do you use your karma in the best possible way to follow a high class teaching? That is the question, moment to moment, day by day, for any practitioner. And how do you answer that? Practice and help. These are the two major aspects and everything else follows after that. So we have a job as practitioners which will never end. And that's the good news. The bad news? There is no bad news. <laughs> Next question. At the beginning of your talk, uh, you mentioned three uh, spiritual genius in Orient uh, and three figures in Western civilizations, like uh, Abraham, Moses, and Christ, right? So uh, the three Asian um, genius, I understand uh, that uh, they, they are very important figures here, uh, but they have they created the different spiritual traditions, three, each of three. But the three in Western tradition, they create the same religion, right? So how three persons are important? Well, 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 Kanjang Nimdi, three Western religions, they are not the same. They are, in fact, very, very different in their cultural, social, or for that matter, political function. The core, we can argue, is based on the same scriptures. You're right about that. So if you look at the Old Testament, the Quran, and also the Talmud and the Torah, we have very big similarities between them. Sometimes even the stories are very analog or identical. But the interpretation of these stories, the social, historical, religious, and other aspects around them, they are totally and absolutely different. So these are three very distinct monotheistic religions. And there are the other variations within them and outside of them. And these distinctions are not easy to reconcile. Uh, I had the fortune to visit Jerusalem several times. And that's one spot on earth when these three major religions with its variations, uh, they are literally pitted against one another. It's a very silent presence. You don't see any attrition in the streets. You don't see any big uh, conflicts in the streets. But the way they are together, the way they are squashed in one city for centuries, for millennia together, actually is very characteristic of the human situation. And some people say, if you fix Jerusalem, you fix the Middle East. You fix the Middle East, you fix Central Asia, and if you fix that part of the world, you fix everything west and east of it. It's a very idealistic view, but it has some truth in it. These differences are so big that any attempt so far in the last couple of decades to have the leaders of these three major monotheistic religions to sit down and just have some meal together, all these attempts have proven futile. It didn't work. Too much pride, too much holding, too much attachment, all of this. So if they were not that different, they could ha shake hands easily. And eventually they will all have to. But we all follow the speed of our own recognition, our own realization. And the question is, how much suffering do we need to realize our true human situation our correct human relationship 
and do correct human action in speech, in physical realm, in our thoughts, and in our feelings. So how much suffering do we need to realize all this? We don't know. But there is a threshold. And this threshold is called enough. Now, everyone has slightly different levels of enough. But within broad limits, all human beings have very similar instincts for survival, for possession, for procreation. So when we feel that this leads to loss of life, loss of property, loss of progenity, then people really become afraid. And that's the suffering most of us don't want. So how much of that do we need? How many wars do we need? How many clashes do we need? How many passive-aggressive, silent, suffocating decades do we need to actually recognize something more fundamental than religions, something more common than thoughts or feelings or history, etc.? So it's a big question, but these three religions, they have a hard time with each other. You can see that. OK? Other questions? So then I have a question for you. How do you see your own life? And don't answer me. Answer yourself tonight or tomorrow morning, when you may find some time to sit down and ask that question to yourself again. How do you see your own life? How do you compare yourself from 25, 20, 10, 5 years ago and now? I remember very well when I came to this country for the first time. All faces looked the same on the subway and buses. Very few of them even read the paper. And almost nobody had a mobile telephone. Now all faces look very, very different. Not just because I became familiar with Oriental culture and faces to a certain extent, but also because people develop their individual thinking, their own idiosyncrasies, their own world inside by way of thinking, feeling, thinking, feeling all to themselves and for themselves. So the faces started to differ. These little microcosmos inside, they started to form. And individuality in Asia became stronger than before. Now you see almost everybody having some kind of device in which their attention is focused and sometimes lost. And then you don't give your seat to the elderly. You don't recognize that somebody needs help. You are not in the moment because you're not paying attention. So group-based society had its own drawbacks, and sometimes it was holding individuals down very, very strictly. In Confucianism, since they were high class enough, if anybody was rebellious, mostly they were not martyred. They were not executed. They were banished or exiled to a remote area, sometimes even an island. And Korea has a lot of coastal islands, and I heard about exiles who spent the rest of their lives there because they didn't like the system. And the system also didn't accept them. They didn't accept dissent. Now, anything based on the cohesion of the group is seriously challenged by the culture that the group itself created. Did anybody from Park chung generation know that 50 years later we would look like this? Very few. In fact, maybe none. We should never forget that this culture was created by our fathers and mothers and granddads and grandmothers for us. It with the belief that this would be better than theirs. This would be more enjoyable or more perfect than theirs. Did that happen? If you look inside, you find that if you don't change your mind, your world doesn't change. The exterior form, the ways of communication, the ways of transportation, they changed, but the passengers, did they change? 
or they carry roughly the same kind of consciousness with a slightly different content as before? And the answer is, if we repeat our problems, if we repeat our crises as a society or as a human race, then we didn't change. We didn't change the fundamental characteristics of our consciousness, whether as an individual, a group, a society, or a species. Now, that's why we have a job. That's why practice, the internal work, and the communication of that mind work will never be obsolete, and it will never be redundant. That's why you can trust that. Uh, you uh, looked over the uh, last 20 years how Korea has changed uh, from your uh, observation of uh, the most present uh, situation uh, in Korean society, uh, the fast, uh, like, uh, uh, fat, uh, the new newness uh, of people and their uh, behavior and, and their interest, see, uh, following uh, the patterns uh, of their living, how do you predict See, in predict? Yeah, wow. Future. I can predict. I'm, I'm not a soothsayer or a clairvoyant. I shouldn't predict. And I cannot, fortunately. I'm very happy with that. Why? Somebody who predicts your future steals your future. The future is totally of our making, our own decision. So what kind of decisions do we make? As an individual, it's very hard to predict. Like anyone can stand up in the audience and leave, and I cannot see that or predict that. But if you want to predict a family, then you can say that most Korean families in Chuso get together. Or most Buddhists in like once a year, they go see a temple around Puchon Yimoshi, Nal or Buddha's birthday. And if you want to predict a society, then it's even easier. You just have to look at statistics, like demography, industry, healthcare, culture, etc., etc. So we cannot predict, but we can see that the bigger the mass is, the easier it is to see the trends. You can change the trends, but the bigger the sample, the better the assessment is. So in that sense, I can say a few things, which is, I think, common knowledge. The first is that it's impossible to stop the trend of westernization in Korea. You can't. So people will become more individualistic, more isolated. Society will have more disparities. And the old structure, as we know it, will fall apart. It is already seriously damaged. So people don't think in terms of the old structure in the way that they thought 25 years ago. They look for themselves first, their own happiness, and their own individuality, and then the group, whether it's family or friends or others. This used not to be like that 50 years ago, especially not after the Korean War. After the Korean War, for many years, the question was, whenever you met somebody, did you eat today? You don't see that question anymore. Because, of course, that's not necessary anymore. But other aspects of society that held this society together, more attention, more compassion, more wisdom, they are decreasing because we fill our minds with other content than that. What is the solution? First of all, the solution is lying in each and every one of us, in our own hearts. Like I said, in your own individual decision, which no one can predict. Only you can do that. If you make the right choice, then you help a small group of people around you, and that will help a greater and greater and greater group around you, of course, with the effect decreasing over time and space. But what to do with the social changes in Korea when the elite is getting supremely rich, the middle class is getting by, and there's an increasing amount of totally impoverished people that you can see already in the streets. 
those who didn't dress well on that day, those who really don't look so well, and maybe they couldn't even clean themselves so well. And there's more and more and more of them because the minds of the responsible people with a lot of money and power are not about society as a whole, but only as interest groups and individuals relating to each other. This change is something which is impossible to stop. What can you do? You can make it faster. Why? Because if you make it fast enough, then that generation, which was brought up in a different way, will still be alive when the current generation will get frustrated, tired, disillusioned, and want to reach back for something which existed before this consumerism began, this individuality and isolation and alienation began. In Europe, we know that from our own experience. And the, the problem is that it happened in the West very slowly, over 400 years. The start of democracy is really not Greece. That was a good start for them, but for centuries after that, it disappeared. The start of democracy is really after the English Revolution, when there was the first kind of constitutional monarchy after the nobility and the royalty, plus the commoners, they made an agreement. It was the 17th century. So then slowly, slowly, science, democracy, culture, etc., etc., developed, and the individual, through humanism, became the focus of the West. That was like a frog, slowly boiled, starting from cold water, and every couple of decades it increased, 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 and in the 20th century it reached a boiling point, and within a century over 100 million people died of the two world wars. That was the boiling point. And after that, everything changed. Just look at Germany. What did Germany have to go through to reach the current level of culture and social cohesion and responsibility? You look at the last 150 years and it's terrible. So here we have to have another effect. When you drop a frog into boiling water, it immediately jumps out. It's amphibious, it's a cold-blooded animal. So when it suddenly feels that it's boiling, boom, it jumps. So Korea can still jump. The strength of the old generation is still there, but it's diminishing because of time. The strength of the old tradition, Bulgyo, Tokyo, Yukio, it's still there, but it's diminishing because all other ways of thinking and other religions grab the new minds and take its place. So if this is happening fast enough, and it's happening at the speed of KTX, then in a few years or maybe one or two decades, a very large amount of people will say, enough, we don't want to live like this. What else is there? And then the old tradition is still there. But if it's like boiling it over centuries, it will stop. It will fail. It will slowly transform into something where you have to reinvent everything. So don't let that happen. We shouldn't reinvent everything that was given to us over centuries. And if we, if we are just honest with ourselves, then we follow the correct path. Because nobody wants to purposefully suffer. And if we go deep enough with that, then we also don't want to make others purposefully suffer. And that intent alone can save our tradition. That will give us enough loyalty, commitment, and action power to save the values for the time when large masses will need them. At this point, you cannot say that Korea socially en masse, at a large scale, would be interested in going back to the old spiritual values. This is not the case. Everybody wants quick career, financial security, 
nice and good place to live, consume everything that they want, and that's where it stops. Largely, that's it. Some people have a greater sense of responsibility. But what we do not see in the West, and increasingly we forget in Asia too, that freedom and responsibility, they go hand in hand. If we don't take responsibility, we cannot be free. Freedom starts with taking responsibility. I'm responsible for this. So I have the freedom to fill it up or consume it because it's my job. So it sounds very simple, but having freedom on this earth starts with taking responsibility for this earth. These two things are usually outruling each other, especially in the West. I don't want any responsibility. I want to be free. It doesn't work. If you look deeply, it never worked and it never will. So doing just what I want is another matter. But if you want freedom, you have to take responsibility. And if you took responsibility, then you have freedom. These two go hand in hand. Translate that to human relationships like commitment or loyalty. And when you have that, you have a meaningful human relationship. So when it's a marital relationship, it's easy to see that. When it's a larger or, or group-based social relationship system, then that kind of commitment, that kind of loyalty is also important. And it takes a different form. But the function of holding us together as one big human field of existence, that is very common. That is something we should see. So I hope that all of us in this room and those who watch this footage um, had an insightful time and got some inspiration to look deeper inside and uh, find our true purpose in life so that we would have a balance between the power that we wish to acquire or subject ourselves to and the pleasure that we want to experience and give to others would be all matched up with the purpose of all this. And when we do that, then we can live a more meaningful life. And if we practice, then we can wake up get rid of our illusions and unnecessary dualities, and save this world from suffering. Thank you very much for your attention.